All right, welcome again to Discovery Church. Make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house this morning. Isn't it good to be in God's house, man? I'm so grateful to worship with you guys and to dig into the Word of God with you guys. We've been in this series called Rhythm, and we just started the year with this Word and this series inviting you not to, like, try out religion, not to, like, like set your goals right and get your goals right, but to actually find the rhythm of Jesus. And that is actually, that's the secret to a walk of faith is actually not following the rules, but keeping in step with Jesus' rhythm. So, so let me show it to you in Matthew chapter 11. I'll give you kind of a recap and tell you where we're going today. I need to jump right in because I got a lot of stuff that I want to share with you today. If you are new at Discovery, this has been our theme verse. This is where this idea of rhythm comes from. Jesus speaking in Matthew chapter 11, he says, Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? So there's easy to get burned out when you're trying to follow the rules. And that's not the way it was supposed to be done. That's at its, at its core, like Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. So Jesus offers something different to us this year. Maybe not trying to do the right things. How about we just try to get in the right step? He says, hey, come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. And here it is. He says, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Jesus modeled an unforced rhythm with the Father. So in part one of this series, we talked about this rhythm of prayer and fasting that Jesus modeled. Uh, and how cool would it be if this year we didn't just think that prayer or fasting were good things and good ideas, but we had a rhythm this year that we actually sought God in prayer and fasting. So we began the year with 21 days of prayer and fasting, and today marks the end of prayer, of our 21 days of prayer and fasting, to which many of you are like, praise God. For others of you, this is like your fourth ending, but that's all right. You've, you've started and stopped it six times, but it's okay. But now, so now you get off the wheel. You can get off that wheel, and, and we're done with the prayer and the fasting part of it, and now we can start prayer and feasting, all right? So anyway, that was week number one. We talked about a rhythm of prayer and fasting. You can go back and watch that. And week number two, we talked about a rhythm of silence and solitude, something that's not talked about a lot, doesn't get a lot of air time in, in teaching, and, but, but there is actually a lot in the scripture about it. Jesus modeled that rhythm of rest and silence and solitude, and we talked about the importance of that if you really want to stay in rhythm this year, that that's a, a big one. Last week, we talked about getting in the rhythm of God's word, like building our life on the sure foundation of the word of God. All right, this week, today. I want to talk to you about having a rhythm of worship. Someone say worship. Like having a, a rhythm of getting into the presence of God. And as I was preparing this message and this teaching, I thought how good it would be, man. Like if, if we were to create a rhythm of, of worship, say like some of the practices. Like I was thinking, man, how awesome would it be if you just committed to stay in rhythm of worship as like uh, even here. Like, like coming to worship every week at your church and worshiping with your spiritual family and like hearing the word of God and like worshiping God like every week how like some of you your life would be so changed if you just said I'm going to church every week and I'm going to worship God like and then and then when I'm there I'm just not going to ex, like experience worship I'm going to get into worship okay I'm not just going to like experience it but but I'm going to do that whole lift your hand thing I'm going to be brave man and, uh, I see other people doing it. I don't know what that's about, but okay. I, I don't know. Like, that's, that's how I, I, when I first got saved, I'm not from church or anything like that, not from religion, but I was like, I went to a church. They were just, it was a Pentecostal church. They was, so they were like, they were crazy, man. And but I wanted what they had. I'm like, that's, that looks cool, man. And, and so I remember the first day I raised my hand in church, man. I, I actually, I, I, I did the quick little, some of you probably can sympathize with this. I was looking around in worship. I was like, okay, I'm going to do it today. I actually built myself up. Like, I'm going I'm to lift my hand today. And I remember, like, I was looking around, like, I'm worshiping. I was just like, yeah, I lift my hand. I put it back down like that. And I was like, I felt really good. Like, dang, I got, I got into it. I got into it. I felt the presence of God. So, but, I mean, how awesome would that be for you to just get free in your worship expression and not just experience but actually get into and allow yourself to freely express 
your worship to God. How cool would that be? We just had a night of worship last night. How many of you came to night of worship last night? And I thought, like, how cool would it be to, like, if you got in this rhythm of even, like, these once a month on the third Fridays where we just encounter God. There's a short just teaching, a prophetic word, just a declaration that, that we'll give, and then it's just kind of back to worship. And, and so I, I just thought, man, it would be awesome if you got in this rhythm where you were worshiping God and committing to, like, be in God's presence. But as I was studying, I just I felt this pull to go in a different route. You may want, yeah, I want you to do those things. I do. But I feel, like, I feel like today I want to, to show you um, like the theology side of worship and to get a, to study what worship is and, and who you are and, and to, so that you can actually get in the right rhythm. Because honestly, yet it's not really, worship is more than a song. It's more than a service. Worship is more than a feeling. It's more than, than the goosebumps. And those things are all, all great. They come along with it often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's so much more than that. So I want to, I want to do, can we just, uh, can I study the word of God with you this morning? We're going to dig into some scriptures together because I want you to see some. So what I want to show you today, many Christians will live their entire life and not hear what I'm about to teach you today or even read some of the scriptures. I'm about to ex expand and show you some truths about today to get the, this, the, the theology of of worship. Luke chapter 4, let me begin here with, with, with Jesus, and, and like he was, when he was led into the wilderness to be tempted by the enemy, here's what the Bible says in that interaction, that the devil led him up to this high place and showed him, and you notice that he's always trying to go high, the enemy, showed him in, in an instant all the kingdoms of the world, and he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, it has been given to me. So he's got, Satan's got some authority here. He said, I can give it to anyone I want to. I got some authority in this realm called earth. Here's, here's the caveat, though, Jesus. This is the devil talking to Jesus. This is Matthew chapter 4. He says, if you worship me, it will be yours. Which, and I'm showing you this to, to show you, like, this was the, the, the first encounter that, that we see Jesus having with the devil recorded in Scripture. And what he's trying to do with Jesus is what he's still trying to do with you. He's trying to take your worship he's trying to get you now look if he can't if you if he can't get you to worship him he'll get you to worship any created thing as long as you're not worshiping the one you're supposed to be worshiping so you are inadvertently worshiping him who is involved in this called the god of this age maybe you're not doing it to him so you're like i wouldn't take him up on that deal i wouldn't worship satan yeah but 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 what are you worshiping then because jesus says, no 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 i'm, I'm going to worship the lord i'm gonna serve him only and so maybe you want to, because if you're not worshiping God, you're worshiping something. So let me, uh, uh, let me ask you a question before I even jump into this teaching. They're just setting the foundation here of, of this thought. Uh, ask your, if, if, you're, if you're wondering, like, what am I worshiping then? Here's a good question to ask yourself to find that out. Where is your sanctuary? So, so, so what is a sanctuary? Where do you run to when you're hurt? Where do you go for safety, for security? In times of trouble, think about you have a hard day. You have a hard day at the office. You go home. What's the first thing you do? Do you run to the refrigerator for comfort food, ice cream or something? Do you call up a trusted friend and start gossiping or venting? Or, eh, eh, or, 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 or what do you do? Do you go and, and, and do you try to, to find release in music or movies or Netflix? You just kind of watch them. You just watch TV. Or maybe you, you, you play video games. I'm just going to, that's my, that's my I, I find my release there. Or maybe you go to pornography and you go to that, that pornography. That makes me, that's just where you go to. Every time you get stressed and anxious and the sanctuary, you, where you go to tells a lot about who you are. Let me say it this way. The high ground we seek reveals the geography of our worship. Come on, Pastor. I'm preaching now. Give me some back. Give me, talk to me. Talk to me. Okay, the geography, where you go, where, what sanctuary you go to for your safety, your security, your comfort, it reveals where you're what, what you're worshiping. It reveals who we're worshiping. And I'll tell you that um, because we need to study. What I want to do today is the theology side of worship. I want to kind of go back to. Like the first time the Bible is mentioned. So let me ask this question. Uh, who is the first worshiper? Who's the first? So the reason why we ask this question, I really want to study this with you. And I'm going to, uh, bear with me today. We're going to dig into stuff. But, and I'll show you why it's important. When, when I was studying for the ministry, this was, every time you want to study a topic, they teach you to go back and find the first place it's mentioned. It's called the law of first mention. 
okay? So, so whenever you want to learn about a topic, you, you should go back to the place it's first mentioned in the Bible, because so, that's where the purest teaching of it is. So the, the first worshiper that is listed in the Bible is actually an archangel named Lucifer, okay? He's, he's, and some of you may, may be familiar with, with that name, and I want to describe it to you in a little bit. But before I do, I want to tell you about these, these, um, the different angels that are actually named in the Bible, and I'll tell you why yeah, that, that's important. But there's three different angels that are named in the Bible. The first na- angel that's named, and these aren't in your notes, I'm just setting this up, you guys. The first angel that's named is Michael. And, and Michael, we see him showing up in response to prayer. That's kind of the faculty we see him in. In, in uh, Daniel, you see in the book of Daniel, Daniel was praying, and, and, and Michael comes on the scene and comes to Daniel, and he says, I was actually sent, released by God the moment you prayed, but I was actually doing war in the heavenlies, and I couldn't come earlier. I don't know if that freaks you out or excites you, but it excites me that there's like a spiritual war going on right now. I'm like, it pumps me up. For some of you, you get, it, you, you get afraid. It excites me. But this is, Michael is like, he's like, you see him coming in response to prayer. The second angel that's mentioned is Gabriel. And Gabriel, we, I think we read this verse last week. It's that Christmas story angel that comes in response to giving Mary a word, giving Mary a message about, about this, this God's son, this God child that was going to be born. So that's where we see Gabriel come in and respond. He's given a word. And then we have the third angel listed, this archangel named Lucifer. And Lucifer is the worship leader in heaven. That's, that's who he is. He's, he's the, the worship leader. What's interesting about this list is that all of heaven is represented in this list of these three archangels, meaning all, this is what's happening in heaven. Prayer, the word, and worship. That's what's happening, all of heaven, which in Revelation, in Revela- the book of Revelation says that when Satan was cast out of heaven, when Lucifer was cast out of heaven, he took a third of the angels with him, which are the demons that, that handle the demonic activity of the world. That's, that's the third of those angels that went with Lucifer. And this, is, this isn't like, you know, solid theology. This is just a Jasonism. Okay, this is what I think. I think, I think one-third, one-third, one-third. Okay, and then that, again, that's not, that's not like solid. I'm just, that's what, it's a good representation of what is happening in heaven. So I'm going to jump into this text with you because I want to study this one archangel named Lucifer because he's the, the law of first mention, the first time worship is mentioned. And then we're going to tie it together and I hope to really, that, that you are a different kind of worshiper after understanding these truths. Two places in the Old Testament we're going to study. Isaiah chapter 14, then we're going to jump to Ezekiel chapter 28. We're going to pull out some details, so hang in there with me as we pull them out, and it'll make sense in the end. Isaiah chapter 14 is our first verse. Let me just kind of say, if you want to read this verse in your Bible, if you go to your Bible and go to Isaiah chapter 14, it's going to say that this is addressed to the king of Babylon. You're going to find out, though, that actually who he's talking to is Lucifer, which it it happens in the Bible often where they're addressing a person but but in in that address to the person they're talking to the spirit behind that person so you see this happening jesus actually tells peter get behind me satan right so what was he doing he was telling peter something but he was speaking to the spirit that was influencing peter okay so you see that happening throughout the scripture you see it happening here in isaiah chapter 14 this is a message to the king of babylon but in this message he actually starts to speak to lucifer satan who's the spirit behind the king of babylon and it gives it away in verse 12 look at what it says how you have fallen from heaven well the king of babylon didn't fall from heaven he's talking to the spirit behind the king of babylon and it goes into some detail here that makes a lot of sense how you fallen from heaven morning star son of the dawn you have been cast down to the earth you who were once laid low the nation. So Satan was this angel in heaven and was actually cast out, expelled from heaven to earth. And most scholars actually believe that that happened between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. That's what most scholars and theologians believe that is. So Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, and so the angels are in existence. So when he created heaven, the angels are there in heaven. So, and then this event happens. And he expels Lucifer to the earth, and that makes verse 2 make a lot more sense because it says where he was expelled became formless and void. The earth was formless and void in verse 2. Well, of course it was formless and void. Satan's there. Darkness and dominion is there. So now now verse 3 makes sense because now God has to get back involved, and he says, let there be light. 
So then he, he goes, let me bring some order and light back to the chaos and disorder and darkness that the enemy was creating over here, okay? You all with me still? Yeah. Breathe in, breathe out. Wax on, wax off. We're going we're gonna to get through all this stuff, okay? So he was cast down to earth. He's ladle of the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. Check this out. I, I, I highlight it every time that he uses this phrase, this, these phrases of high places, the, the enemy wants to be lifted up in the high place. Look what it says. I will raise my throne. This is what he says. There's a Lucifer said in his heart. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit in throne on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of Mount Zavon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. And look what he says. Out of all the names of God, he says, I want to make myself like most high. I want to be the, I want to be the highest, which means in his heart, he resents the fact that God was getting all the attention and all the worship, and he decided one day, no, 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 I want to be higher. I want that worship. I want to be above you, which is still his goal today. His goal still today is to try to usurp the authority and the worship of God, and if you, even by worshiping created things, you are inadvertently helping Satan accomplish his goal, Okay. Now, one more verse before we get to Ezekiel. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 11 says this about Lucifer now still. Your pomp is brought down to Sheol and the sound of your stringed instruments. Now, what does that mean? Did Satan carry a harp with him or something like that? No. Um, he is a stringed instrument. So what, what scholars believe is that Satan, Lucifer, was created with, like part of his being in his nature, God gave him stringed instruments. You see, all throughout the scriptures, angels are created very weird, very awesome and terrible. They're like, they got eyes everywhere, wings everywhere, heads that are this and that. So, so a lot of, this is what theologians believe, is that he, in his nature, were stringed instruments that actually music emanated from his being. Where he went he was musical. He, was, he, he just emanated. Worship and music came from his stringed instruments that God created inside of him. Just file that back. We're going to come back to that in a second. Here's the second place that the angel taught. Uh, this angel is taught about, this archangel named Lucifer. In Ezekiel chapter 28. Uh, uh, oh, did I miss some? Yeah, I did. Thank you. you here, Isaiah chapter 14 continues. It says, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone. This is an important one, too. I'm glad. This is a, he, what God is saying here is he was adorned with a whole bunch of, so not only was he given string instruments, but he was like adorned with, like put on him all these precious stones, and it lists it, cornelian and chrysolite and emerald and topaz, onyx, jasper, lapis lazuli, turquoise, and Beryl, like, that was a, he was beautiful. Like, God created him very beautifully. That were, not only was it stringed instruments, but precious stones were given to him. And then it says this, your settings and mountings were made of gold. Now, what does that mean? What does this mean? Like, he had a setting and a mounting on him? Okay, let me show you a different translation in the King James Version. that actually explains that a little bit better. It actually says, um, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes. So that's what that, so, so check this out. Here's, here's what it's saying, that, that the inside of him, inside of like Lucifer were stringed instruments, there, that, but he was also given timbrels, which are cymbals, and pipes, like he was created with this. And I don't know if you know a lot about music, but all musical instruments can be categorized into three categories. Some of you who have taken music theory know there's three categories of all instruments. Let me show it to you. There are stringed instruments. Okay, I know. So you guys didn't come to class for music theory, but this is important. This is like, this is scriptural, and I'm trying to show you like what's going on here through this scripture. The stringed instruments are the violins, your guitars, your, your anything you pluck, right? Your, even, even a piano is a stringed instrument. That's something you pluck. It's a chord that you pluck. That's a stringed instrument. And then there's the percussion instrument. That's a, that's a second type of instrument that's grouped in that's your drums and your cymbals anything you bang or gong or to make to make noise and then you have the wind instruments that anything you blow into to make noise so your flutes and your saxophones all that stuff so if you had like a choir your choirs you'd have all these you'd have these sections you'd have stringed instruments over here percussion instruments over here and then you would have the wind instruments over here you'd separate them by there here's what you need to know is that that lucifer was created in his being with all three of these things 
In his being, he emanated from himself a stringed instrument, a, a percussion noise, a, a wind instrument. Like from his being, that's, that's what happened. He possessed those things. And on top of that, of being adorned with that and all these precious jewels, he goes on to say that you were anointed, he says. So not only did he have music, but when he, when he, did, when he did music and we did worship, power came with it. Like there was anointing that came with the music that he, that he played. And there still is today, like even today, there is still, music is powerful. Worship is powerful. All music is power, powerful. Like that's why you can come into a worship experience like this. And you, all this, this music and worship, and you can experience the presence of God. You can sense it because it's powerful. God created, like you can influence culture with you. Not, just, not even just spiritual. There is power in secular music. It, music can move you, doesn't it? You listen to music, it, it moves you. Sometimes it moves you in the wrong direction. It's, it's that powerful. You can shape and shift cultures, and they have and will continue to be shaped and shifted by the music of the dominating voices of music in that culture. If you don't believe me, let me give you an example. In 1980, Ozzy Osbourne came out with a song called Suicide Solution. That year, suicides increased by 400%. Like, it, it worked. It happened. Now listen, say, you, Here's what you need to know. Satan still is anointed to worship. He's anointed in music. Not a holy anointing, but there still is power when he worships and when that music. And so he's getting his message out there through the media. He is. Now, you don't need me to be a Holy Spirit for you. You have the Holy Spirit to understand and discern what music you should be listening to, what music you shouldn't be listening to, because that music is moving you one way or the other. Okay. Get him off my soapbox. You were... So he says, you were anointed, like, like your power came with that, as a guardian cherub, that's another word for angel, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in all your ways from the day you were created until wickedness, he says, was found in you. That's what we actually just study when he got prideful. He, he explains it. Through your widespread trade. And that's an, so what, what did he trade? He traded what was given to him for the glory of God. He traded that to give glory to himself. you got to be careful because we'll sometimes make the same trade. Because we'll come into here and we'll give lip service to God and go out there and worship something else. And give our devotion to something else. Give our time to something else. Give our hearts to some other things. And when that happens, when you make that trade, here's what happened. You were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God and expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty because of the way I made you. I made you so powerful and beautiful. And corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to earth. I made a spectacle of you before the kings, he says. God expelled him from the earth. And actually, Jesus talks about the event that happened. Because this was like before. This was a lot like in Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. This is before all creation. That this event happened. Jesus actually tells us he was there. And he gives us a little picture of what happened. Look at, in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus has given us an account of when that happened. He said, I saw it. I saw Satan fall. Look how he fell. Like lightning from heaven, which is so cool. Which you, cause some of you think that the cosmic power between good and evil is this, like when it's, it's God and the devil, and they're duking it out up there, man. And it's like, it's like a good movie. Evil is winning a little bit, and then good's winning a little bit, and then evil's winning. And then at the last second, God wins. And it's this cool, it's like, you know, Star Wars or something like that. It's like Darth Vader versus Luke Skywalker. And you got the wrong picture. If, if this was a movie, if this event was a movie, it would be one millisecond. Because what Jesus is saying, I was there when my dad decided to finally deal with that fool. <laughs> he said, it was, I saw it happen like lightning. It just was like, boom. We got, God just said, get out, and he was gone. That's it. That's it. It was just lightning, and he's gone. Y'all need to know, like, like, yes, Satan has power. Yes, he does. And he is like the little G God of this age. But there is no other name greater than the name of Jesus. There is no other power greater than the power of Jesus. So, but now, now because of this, you know, he's, he was cast out. Now, 
there's a position that needs to be filled. Because now God still wants those three things happening in heaven. He wants prayer. He wants the word. He wants worship. But there's a vacant archangel position. There's a vacancy on his staff. So the question is, jot it down in your note. Who's the new worship leader? And some of you can feel it right now, can't you? You know who it is. It's you. It's me. We, we, we were created to fill the vacancy of worship that, that was left void from this beautiful archangel that got proud and, and, and wanted to exalt himself. And everything he did as he created Lucifer, he put that in you and on you so that you could do the job he created you to do well. In fact, you want to hear something cool? He even created you with all three types of instruments of worship. Inside of your being, you emanate music. You know that? He, he put inside of you as, as, a, as, as humans. Like you, he created you with stringed instruments. He put it inside you. You know where? They're called vocal cords. They're cords in your, in your, in your that, that through these cords vibrating with my voice, I can, I can fluctuate my tone and my volume, and I can sing praises to the King of Kings. I can glorify his name. I can exalt him. I can worship him through the cords, the stringed instruments he has given me. He's given you, per, he's given you wind instruments. You know, it's your lungs. That's the wind instruments. It's through this wind instrument of lungs that I can pass through the pipes of my vocal cords and I can shout praises and sing praises and give glory to my God. He, and he created you with percussion instruments. You say, where are those percussion instruments? Right here, baby. That's a, to, to make noise and sound and glorify God. He created you to be... A worship leader to worship him out of your very being. You're, listen, you're the replacement for the unemployed angel named Lucifer. You are. He created you to worship him. And I think, I think not only is that cool, that's cool. But that really changes the way we worship. That really changes how we see. It's a life-changing reality of how we see and have this rhythm now. Because I want you to do, yeah, I want you to come to church and worship and night of worship and first 15 minutes of your day, put that five minutes of worship. I want you to get some worship in there, but this changes things. This, this changes. So what is all that supposed to mean for me and how should it change my life? Let me give you three truths today that I hope can change your life and the way that you worship. Number one, God made me from him. I was made from God. In other words, when he made you, he made you from himself. Let me explain that to you because this can be a whole teaching by itself. In the creation account of Genesis, God did two different things. God created things and he made things. And some of you are like, well, what's the difference, man? He created and made. Okay, look, a created thing is something that came from nothing. So, so, which, by the way, only God has that power to create something from nothing. He just said, let there be, and it was. Let there be light, and there was light. Okay? So that's, that is a created thing. A made thing is making something from something that already was in existence. That's what the difference is. It would be like me giving you clay and say, hey, make a vase. And you make a vase from that clay. You made something from something that's the difference there. In fact, let me show you. I put it in the creation account. I put a verse in there, Genesis chapter 1, verse 11, to show you. God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land. So God didn't say, let there be trees. He didn't just magically create a tree. No, he made a tree from the earth. Now, why? Why did he do that? What's the difference between the two? The difference is this, whenever he makes something from something else, he always intended there to be a relationship between the thing that he was making it from. So here's what he did. He said, hey, earth, produce a tree. And then, hey, tree, you are from this earth. You are to get your strength from this earth, your sustenance from this earth, your life from this earth. The moment that you think you can survive apart from this earth that I created you from, you will die. I created you, 
I made you in a symbiotic relationship. You need each other. Which is like with humans what he did. He took, with, with woman, you know how he created a woman? He didn't just say, let there be a woman. And a woman came around the corner and Adam was like, whoa, man. No, that's not what happened. He, remember, he put Adam to sleep. He took a rib. He took a rib. And he made woman from, made woman from, man. Hey, why did he do that? Because he always intended there to be a relationship between the two, that we would be dependent and need each other, that literally we cannot continue our legacy in life and genealogy without the connection of a man and woman in holy matrimony. Okay, so, so I, I hope I'm, are you with me, you guys? Are you there? Okay, so the question is, then mankind, like all humans, all people, were we created or were, were we made? We were made. Well, what were we made from then? Genesis chapter 1, 26. God says, let us make mankind from ourself. Let's, let's, put me, let's put us in him. Let's make him from our image. And so every one of us was made from God. Why is that important? Because you came from God. Hey, man, you came from God. You are sustained by God. You will get your life from God. The moment you think you can survive disconnected from the source of you were made, you will die. Which, in the creation account, actually happened. They were spiritually dead. You say, wait a second. But they didn't die. And I've heard like we were from the dust. We, we, yeah, wait, he created Adam from the dust now. Isn't that what he says? Yes, your body was created from the earth. So, hey body, hey body, you were created from the earth. So from this earth, you will get your sustenance, you will get your strength, you will get your air, you will get your life. The moment you stop living off the sustenance of this earth body, you will die. But your spirit was made in the image of God. Are you seeing this, you guys? I was made from God. Okay? I hope that personalizes your relationship with God. So, so okay, here's the second truth. The second truth is this, that God, okay, he made me, yeah, but he made me to be with him. Like, that was the reason why I came from him, was so that there could be a relationship between the two of us. Now, that's important because I'm convinced that too many people have a formal relationship with God. Like, it's, it's, it's this distant, connected like, like, I'll go to, okay, God, I'll come to your house every week, and we'll kind of reconnect and stuff. And every week I'll come visit you and uh, give you a little bit of money and do some nice things. That's not what God wants. God doesn't want those things. He wants you. He made you to connect with him. Not a religious experience, but a relationship. And that's why I went this direction in this rhythm series, because I don't think it's about just doing a whole bunch of lists of worship things. It's actually at the heart of it, it's a relationship. Paul gives us an example of this relationship. In Ephesians chapter 5, the whole chapter is actually about marriage. But then he inserts this in Ephesians chapter 5. It says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. And that's like, yeah, that's, that's about marriage. But then he says this, check this out. This is a profound mystery, but I'm actually not talking about marriage right here. He says, I'm actually talking about Christ and the church. So... God says, you see that love relationship right there? You see that couple getting married? They just can't wait for the reception and the honeymoon and all. Like, like, you see that? I want that. That's what I want. That's the kind of, like, relationship and connection. Like, you know, they can't, they can't wait to live their life together, spend every day together, talk every day together. That, that, so God, God looked at all of his creation. He was like, what do I want it to look like? The best example he, can, he, he, could, he could come up with was, I want it to look like that. That intimate connection between a husband and a wife, like that's what I want. I want to be intimately involved in your life. And you need to know that. And when this all ends one day, and we're like, we stand, we're, we stand before God and go to heaven. A lot of people have it confused, man. A lot of people think that you're going to be like in this angelic choir, like forever, just singing. Or bowed before God, like forever, like or maybe you turn into a fat baby angel and play a harp or something like that. <laughs> Sprout wings or something like that. That's not biblical. That's not what happens. But like God has enough angels worshiping him. Do you know that? He has enough winged creatures. He, you don't get wings, okay? 
Do you know there's an angel in heaven? I know some of you are like, dang it, I was really looking forward to my wings. I wanted to fly around and stuff. I'm like, I'm ruining your guys' heaven experience right now. But hopefully I'm going to make up for it in just a moment with telling you what it's really like. But, but he has like an angel that actually never stops crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. Like, so he doesn't need that. He doesn't need that stuff. He doesn't need your attendance. He doesn't need your, he doesn't need your money. He, doesn't, he wants you. He wants to be connected to you. That's what the heaven is going to be. You know, in heaven, um, the Bible says in Revelation that there's going to be this, this wedding ceremony when you come to heaven. It's actually, he, we're called the bride of Christ. You know that? And after the bride, like after there's this marriage ceremony between us and Jesus, there's going to be a wedding reception after. You know what that is? It's a party. Heaven, you know what heaven looks like? Heaven looks like an awesome party. That's what it looks like. They're going to have food and, and music and the meatballs on a, on, a, on a toothpick that I love so much. I just, you know what I mean? They're going to have all that. It's, it's going to be a party, man. And we're going to laugh. We're going to be with Jesus. And look, he calls us the bride of Christ. I'll show it to you in scripture. Gen, uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 9 and 10. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues. This is like the end time stuff, you guys. He came and said to me, come, I will show you. The bride, that's who are the bride of Christ. But then he says this, he calls us the wife of the lamb. Do you know that you, some of you men, that just freaks you out right now, when you're like, what are you talking about? I'm a wife? <laughs> yes. Jesus wants to be intimately close. Look what else it says. I point out some things to you. Look what else it says. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high. And showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Look what it says. And the foundations of the city where he took us from. Now this is our home. These city walls were decorated with every kind of what? It's what he gave Lucifer. He's giving you. But he's not giving you in your created being because it made him proud. And it made him exalt himself, the beauty and the splendor that he was created with. He's given it to you, but he's given it to you in heaven. Just because he loves you. He wants to give you some precious stones. And it lists them. Like all these stones. Give, and, and you're like, well, do I really? Like, yes. It's, this is why, th you know, this is special. God, the reason why he wants to, it's like a, on Valentine's Day or the day before at 9 p.m., most of you guys are going to be like, oh, dang, you're going to rush to a jewelry store. And you're gonna be like, let me get her something shiny. I'll get her something shiny. And then you're going to, because what you want to do is you want to open the box and see her go, oh, like that thing. I don't know why the leg always goes up. But that's what, it's, it's, that's what you want to see. He wants to be that special. And this, look, God wants, look, this is the reason why he wants to give you these precious stones is just, is just for that reason. Because he loves you. And he, he wants to lavish you. He wants to see that moment that you go, for me? You did that? You giving that to me, God? And it lists all of it. Like there's 12 of them. All the, like a whole bunch of, I'm not going to name them to you. There's just a whole bunch of stones. God says, all right, you're going to misuse that on earth. Because you're my new worship leader, so I'm going to give it to you in, in heaven. Okay. He made you from him to be with him. All of that to get you to this place now, this rhythm of worship. But this third one. Um, he made me to express love to him. Which is, listen to me, which is the heart of worship. Worship is not a song. It's not a service. It's more than that. Is it, it, are those expressions of it? Absolutely. But we are made from him, with him, to him. All he wants, listen to me, is not your religious performance. All he wants is for you to love him back. That's it. How beautiful, how simple this gospel is. It's not a religion, it's a relationship. Jesus himself said it this way in John chapter 4. I was actually going to begin this teaching with this. Because this is where Jesus gives us the theology of worship. But I decided to end with it. He says this, yet a time is coming. And it's now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And then he says this amazing statement, for they are the kind of worshipers that the Father is actually looking for. He is seeking people that worship him. Again, more than the hands raised, that's all good. God loves it. God put those instruments in you, the percussions and the wind and the strings, just because he loves to receive your praise and adoration. He loves your expression of love. But, but he, he did that, all that, 
so that you would love him. He's not looking for your church attendance. He's not looking for good people. He's not looking for tithers. He's not looking for people who serve in kids' church. All those things are great. They're great things. Like, he likes it, but that's not what he's looking for. He's looking for worshipers. Now, as you know, the New Testament was written in Greek. And that, I was looking at the, the Greek word of this word worship, and I put it in your notes up here on the screen. It's proskuneo. That's a Greek word. And the, the translators, they had a hard time, like oftentimes, with the Greek is just a very, there are seven times more words in the Greek language than English. It's just hard to really translate it. Sometimes it would be like sentences for just one word. This is one of those instances where the translation is hard, and they chose worship, but that's not what this verb, it's actually a verb, and it's not at its core what he's actually saying here. He's not, he's not saying, because... Uh, because it's an action thing. It's a verb. It's an action. Because some of you, the reason why you need to know it's a verb, it's an action, because some of you are like, well, I love God in my heart. And you ain't, you got no action. You got no verb. It's not a verb for you. Can I tell you that's not worship? So that's, that, it isn't. It, a, a worship that is not expressed, that'd be like telling your, your wife, I love you, but I ain't never going to show you it. I love you in my heart, baby. <laughs> Don't expect... <laughs> Don't expect any lovey-dovey stuff from me, though. I said I'd do, and that's it. Right? That, I mean, you know, that's, a, that's an unhealthy marriage, okay? So th this, this word, this word, it, it blew my mind. It was one of the most astounding revelations that I have ever seen in studying original language of, of the biblical manuscripts. Here's what this word actually means. It actually means, it's a verb, and it means to kiss. <laughs> Look, I didn't write that. God did. God is looking for worshipers. He's seeking. This is what he's saying. God is seeking people who just want to kiss him. That may weird some of you out, right? It's not the kind of kiss you may be thinking of. It's not the kiss of like lovers. It's, it's the kiss of, this proskuneo is a kiss that is described of like the relationship of a father and his children. Think of it like this, like, like when, I, when I come home sometimes from being at a long day or maybe even a long trip and I come home and my keys hit the door and I can hear the noise and excitement of the kids coming to run to the door and I open the door and they go, Daddy, and they come and they run and hug me and they kiss me and I kiss them. That's what that is. God is seeking worshipers who just can't wait to see him, who want to hug daddy and kiss him and love him and hold him and miss him. Like, like people, when it's time for a night of worship or church, we were like, I ain't coming late. I want to get, no, I ain't coming. Some of you are like, I just like the word part, so I'll just come to the second, third song. And he's 15 minutes in. And he's looking for some people that don't just intellectually know about him, but want to kiss him. So, and I, and I intentionally went this direction because I want you to have expressions of worship. I do. God created you to express worship. And I do want you to create rhythms where Come to church every week, man. Make it a discipline, rhythm. Come to night of worship. Have your own worship time where you're actually using what God has given you in your being to declare his praises. But all of that would miss the mark if you don't kiss him. If you don't love him. If it's not this relationship thing created from him to love him. Can I pray that over you with every head bowed, every eye closed in this place? I just want to pray like some of you have never, feel like you've never maybe been in that intimate relationship with God. Maybe you've never even heard that that was kind of, that God created you from him to be connected to him. And maybe you just know in your heart, some of you just know the reason why life feels like it's missing some things. Like you're not getting uh like you know there's more to this life because the things that you're trying to get life from can, were never designed to give life to you. You were created only, only, only to receive your life, your sustenance, your, your security, your hope. Like this is, it's from this place, the presence of God. He made you from Him to be with Him and to love Him. He wants to love you. That's it. Like you don't need to clean stuff up and fix stuff to come to Jesus. You just need to come just as you are. 
With every head bowed and eye closed, I would like to start right there before I pray over everyone. For some of you, you've never really surrendered your life to him. Maybe you didn't even know what that looked like. Maybe it did look more like a religious thing and not a relationship thing. And today, you, you, the Holy Spirit is tugging on you. And I want to encourage you to respond to that. Respond to him. And if some of you, you've done that before, you've given your life to him, but you need to do it again. I'd love to help you make that decision today. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. Meaning this, you can have a fresh start today. Doesn't matter what you've done, no matter how far you've gone, you can get a clean slate and a fresh start right here, right now. It's yours. If you respond. With every head bowed and eye closed, I'm not going to have you come up to the front, but right where you are, I'd love to pray for you. I'm going to count to three in just a moment. And when I do, I'd, I'd love for you to just lift up your hand really high. If you want a fresh start today, and give Jesus your life. If you're online on the count of three, type in, I need Jesus. Come on, be bold. Here it is. It's your day. One, two, three. Lift it up right here. Lift it up. Lift it up really high. Keep it up. Yes, 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 yes. All over this place. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Amen. Yeah, yeah. All over. Thank you, Jesus. All over this place, God. We surrender. We surrender. We surrender. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, God. Go ahead and put your hands down. Can I help you with this prayer? I'd love for you to whisper it. Whisper it right there. Say something like this. Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins and my past. I surrender my life to you. I declare you are my Lord. Jesus, come live inside of me. Make me brand new. Thank you for saving me today and giving me a clean slate. God, I pray over every person that's here today. That they would have, this year, a rhythm of worship. That we would make a priority of coming to your house, of worshiping you with the instruments that you have given us. That we would declare your praises. That we wouldn't be silent, but we would express this verb of worship to you. And not only that, God, but that we would know you intimately. That we would get comfortable loving you this way as a son or a daughter loves her daddy. To hug you and kiss you and want to be with you. God, teach us to worship you this way. To have a rhythm of authentic worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise if you receive that today. Amen.